What's happening party people? Welcome to Punch Sport Party. My name is Daniel and in this video I'm talking about my top five favorite underrated board games of all time. And when I say underrated, I mean they rank 1000 or lower on Board Game Geek. And so these five games are the games that are that low on the list, but still I would rather play them above games that are much higher on that list. So let's get into it. Number five on the list is Kill Dr. Lucky. Think reverse clue. Instead of trying to find out who done it, you're trying to do it. So you're a disgruntled acquaintance of Dr. Lucky and you are mad at him, furious with him for a banal reason and you are trying to kill him. This game is kind of a hot potato game, I like to say, because what you're trying to do is get in the same room as Dr. Lucky by moving around a board and once you're there, you're going to do a murder attempt and so you can use a weapon card that's in your hand to increase your murder attempt value or you can just poke him in the eye, which I think is hilarious. But every time you fail to kill Dr. Lucky, your contempt grows and so you continue to get more powerful in your murder attempts against Dr. Lucky. And so what other players are doing is they're playing luck cards against you when you make a murder attempt and their luck value has to reach or exceed your murder value. And if it does, your murder fails, but because you keep on growing in contempt for Dr. Lucky, eventually people are not going to have enough luck cards in their hands to stop your murder attempt. Really, this is a game where there's not a whole lot going on. You're just trying to get yourself into the right room with Dr. Lucky, make an attempt on his life, and if you fail, you just try again later as you're getting more and more powerful. Meanwhile, you're trying to drain your opponent's hands of luck cards so that when you make a murder attempt, they have no more cards to play on you. So this game is just silly fun, and it's only on the list because of the Paizo edition of this game. If it wasn't for this edition of the game, it would not be on this list for me. This edition of the game has a few things going for it that the new edition doesn't have. This Art of the Paizo edition is just so evocative of your old versions of Clue. It just looks like the Clue Mansion and the art just pops and it's really pretty. And there's a rule in the Paizo edition that's different that makes it a much better game as far as I'm concerned. Dr. Lucky moves automatically on his own turn and so if he ever moves into a room that you are in, in, it is now automatically your turn again. So it creates some really funky turn order where you might not have a turn for a long time, but at the same time, you can really make a lot of effort to get yourself ahead of Dr. Lucky so that you can have a chain of murder attempts on him because he keeps jumping in to your room. So kill Dr. Lucky, it's not going to be the centerpiece of any of your game nights, but it is definitely worth having a hoot and a holler at a good time. Number four on the list is the build Middle Ages. This is a small little card game that packs a really big punch. If you're looking for a crunchier Euro style engine building game that comes in a really small package, this is going to be it for you. So again, it's not going to take you the distance in terms of that fulfilling experience that a much larger, heavier worker placement Euro game is going to take you, but it's going to get you part of the way. And I think it's really worth having in your collection. So what's really unique about this game is how the worker placement actually works. And how it's working is each construction has a resource cost along the side here, and workers have resources that they have. And so you kind of match them up. And so this guy is giving this construction one gold and two wood. But this construction needs three gold, three wood, two science, and unfortunately, it's going to be very rare that one worker is going to fulfill one construction. You're going to have to play multiple workers to a construction to reach the amount of resources that that construction needs. And this creates a really cool race feel where not only are you worried about getting the right workers from the main market that match your constructions, but you're also paying close attention to how quickly your opponents are completing their constructions. Every time you complete a construction, that construction is going to get you victory points and 
a big income bonus that you can use in later rounds. So this game is a race and it's a lot of fun because you're always torn between do I have the right workers in my pool already and just kind of use them like a nice little engine? Or do I see workers out there that are gonna fit my constructions better and should I waste some actions getting those into my pool or should I just stay the course? There's some really cool decisions happening in a really small space. This is a great game, one of my favorites. That's The Builders Middle Ages. Mangrovia is next. This is from Eli Svensson. He's been getting a lot of attention for The Magnificent and Trail to Kana, two games that are getting a lot of buzz lately. But this is an older design of his. I think it's 2013, 2014. And I think it is brilliant. This is a family way getting to medium area majority style game with some really neat action selection mechanisms and a ticket to ride style card play that really just brings a huge fun factor for me in this game. What makes the action selection really cool in this game is there's a rondelle down in the bottom corner of the board and there's a boat that's going around to these different spaces. And at the beginning of the round, you place your little bowl or disc on an action selection space. And on either side of the bowl, there's going to be an action indicated. And so as this boat goes around this little island, you're going to get to do the left side action that you selected. And then when it comes back around, you're going to do the right side action. What's really cool is that as the boat goes around, there's this give and take happening where yes, you might be first to take cards from the market, but then you're going to be last playing those cards to mark your spaces on the board to try and get your majority. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to play huts on the board to get majorities and rows and columns for end game victory points. And there's also areas that you want to fill in the majority of to get other bonuses. And while that's the heart of the game, this area control area majority grid that's going on, what really brings a fun factor for me are the birds. There's this little section up in the top corner where there's two birds and there's four spaces. There's like a grid of four spaces that indicate terrain types. And there's these birds on two of the spaces, usually directly opposite one another. And these birds from round to round will rotate. And you as players, if you're first player, you get to choose where those birds land. And that indicates where you can play huts to on the board. So on a given round, you might not be able to play in water or grassland spaces, and you can only play on beach and forest spaces. And so this creates a really cool kind of monkey wrench in your plans and other people's plans as you're playing a relatively simple ticket to ride, get the cards, play the cards, put your token on a spot kind of game. This adds just the simplest little wrinkle that I think brings it head and shoulders above other games of its type. I really like Mangrovia. Everyone I've played it with really enjoys it. They think it is delightful and fun. Coming in at number two, we have a study in Emerald. This one is quirky as all get out. This game is strange, but I love it. So I'm talking specifically about the second edition. The first edition of the game is sitting around 800 or so on Board Game Geek. This is down below a thousand. So this game has hidden roles, deck building, area majority, worker placement. It is out of control with the amount of things that it has going on in this game and not a lot of any of those one things. So you're not gonna get a deep feel of worker placement or deck building or area majority as you're playing this game. You're just gonna get this taste of each of these things. And for me, that was really special as I felt like I was just at a buffet kind of taste testing all of these wonderful mechanisms in one package. But what really brings this game home for me is how the scoring works. It is weird as all get out. Okay, so the theme in this game is weird to begin with, right? So we're talking about Lovecraftian, elder gods are ruling the world now, they've won, and now there's loyalists and restorationists. So the loyalists are loyal to the elder gods, they're trying to keep them in power, and the restorationists are trying to kill and destroy the elder gods and restore things to how they used to be. And so on the board, you have these two tracks, which are restorationist tracks and loyalist tracks. And this is probably one of the wonkiest things in the game. So as you play cards, you can move tokens up these tracks. And like I mentioned a little bit before, you're going to get a hidden role at the beginning of the game that you're either going to be a restorationist 
or a loyalist. So you might be moving up the track in your faction's favor, but maybe not. So here's what's gonna happen. Every time a token moves up on one of these tracks, you're gonna track the difference. And everyone around the table is gonna score the points based on that difference. So if there's now a difference between the two factions of two, every player is gonna get two. Whereas if a token ever closes the gap, all the players are going to lose that number of points. And so there's just this constant like back and forth of the point scoring track as you're trying to get to a certain limit break of points based on the number of players and then you trigger game end and then you do the actual scoring. And how the scoring works is because you have a hidden role, you're going to be scoring points throughout the game for no matter what you do. Maybe you're assassinating loyalists or restorationists, maybe you're killing elder gods, you're getting points for all these things. No matter what you do, you're gonna get points. But at the end of the game, you're going to lose the points that you got for doing the thing that was kind of in contradiction to your faction. Trying to figure out who's a restorationist and who's a loyalist is a big part of the fun factor in this game. And so it just really sings on a lot of different levels. And again, I can't take it too seriously because it is this weird mixture of mechanisms and theme and the hidden roles and the point scoring kind of make you scratch your head a little bit, but it does work and it works to bring a major fun factor to a game that you would think is more serious and stark based on the theme but this is just a blast to play a whole lot of fun i highly recommend it a study in emerald the number one underrated game on this list is kashgar this game is sweet a sweet little easy going engine building game. This is a lovely, relaxing, easygoing game until the end. The end gets really intense. But I'm telling you, this game does not get nearly enough love. This is kind of a deconstructed deck building game. So basically you have three separate decks that you are working on, but they're all open face. And what you're going to do is when you acquire a card, you're going to place it on one of your face up card rows and you're not going to be able to use a card unless it is the topmost card on one of your stacks. And what you do to use that card is you simply take it and you put it at the back of a card row. And then you use that card's ability to typically gain resources or to fulfill contracts. And what's really neat is the cards typically get you a certain set of resources and not others. And so you never really feel like you're in a spot where you kind of have everything going for you. You always have a real weakness in a particular resource area that kind of glitches you up, hangs you up as you're trying to fill contracts. So everything that you want to do in this game is determined by the cards in your card rows. You can't just go and get a contract from the market because you have enough resources to fulfill it. You actually need to play a card from one of your card rows that allows you to fulfill a small or large large contract. The core action in this game, at least at the beginning, is to do with your patriarch cards. You start with three patriarchs and they're at the beginning of each of your three card rows that you start with and then you get three starter cards that are tucked in behind each of those patriarchs. But the patriarch, so it allows you to draw two cards from the top of the deck, choose one to play into that card row, discard the other one. But then what you can do is later on usually, you can just kind of pass on your turn and use your whole turn to flip your patriarch over to its matriarch side and then the matriarch lets you go through the discard pile to get a card of your choice from there. So that's a real kind of power move to get the cards that you really need to fulfill the contracts that are out in the market. So this game in a certain sense is your typical deck builder where you're trying to create an engine that will really run for you to just fulfill law contracts and get to the victory condition of 25 points before the other players. But at the same time it does things so differently and almost more methodically. So it's a different style of game than a Splendor or Century Spice Road where there's a real kind of speed and finesse to these games. This game really takes its time because of the different ways that it kind of puts roadblocks in your way where you can get an engine going but it's never going to be a perfect engine. You're always going to be short donkeys or maybe you're short pepper or maybe you're short having cards that actually let you fulfill contracts. So you're always going to be tempted to go back to the discard pile or the main deck to try and get that one last card that you need to really make your engine sing. And so it's this kind of plodding, slow going, easy going, fairly relaxing experience 
until that end game comes upon the group and then there's this real rush that takes place. So just a blast to play, really cool decision space happening in Kashgar. So that's my number one underrated board game of all time. All right, party people, those were five underrated board games. What board games do you just love? that you think are underrated. Tell me in the comments down below. I love to hear from you. And if you are not subscribed to the channel and you've been watching my videos and enjoying what is happening here, please subscribe. I would really appreciate it. And until next time, party people, have the best day.